जय हिंद एवरी वन इन दिस लेक्चर ऑफ द सब्जेक्ट इलेक्ट्रिकल मशीन टू के डब्ल्यू फाइव जीरो थ्री एज पर ए के टी यू सिलेबस फॉर थर्ड ईयर ई एन स्टूडेंट्स आई एम गोइंग टू कंसिडर द यूनिट थ्री ऑफ दिस पर्टिकुलर सब्जेक्ट अ पोर्शन ऑफ यूनिट थ्री इट इज थ्री फेज इंडक्शन मोटर इन दिस पर्टिकुलर लेक्चर आई एम गोइंग टू टेक द टॉपिक्स ऑफ फेजर डायग्राम इक्वलेंट सर्किट टॉक इक्वेशन एंड टॉक स्पीड कैरेक्टरिस्टिक ऑफ थ्री फेज इंडक्शन मोटर The outline of presentation of this lecture is as follows: a review of the rotating magnetic field and principle of operation of three phase induction motor, then phasor diagram, equivalent circuit, torque equation followed by the torque speed characteristic of the motor. As we know that the principle of operation of three phase induction motor is actually based upon production of the rotating magnetic field. so i need to consider i need to give an overview of the production of rotating magnetic field before going into details of the motor so to give you an overview of production of rotating magnetic field let us first consider a representation of the three phase induction motor it is a three phase induction motor for two number of poles we are considering this particular three phase induction motor representation the stator is given stator is provided the three phase windings we can see a a dash b b dash and c c dash here the concentrated no here the distributed windings are shown for representation for analysis purpose it is better to consider the representation by the concentrated winding so phase a winding is shown by two conductors a and a dash phase b winding is shown by two conductors b b dash and phase c winding is shown here with two conductors c c dash so when phase a alone carries current the mmf produced by it will be distributed sinusoidally in the space along the air gap periphery likewise when phase b or phase c are carrying currents alone their respective mmf would be distributed along the air gap periphery in the machine the resultant of the magnetic field the resultant magnetic field produced in the air gap of the machine is actually the phasor sum of it is the phasor sum of or the resultant of three mmfs three individual mmfs fa fb and fc for this let us now consider a three phase supply given to the motor given to the three phase stator of the motor so this is the three phase supply so what we know when a three phase supply is given to the three phase stator winding of the motor a rotating magnetic field is created and we are going to justify this statement what i have just said for justification of the same let us consider three instance 1 2 3 3 the three instance of time are shown over the over the stator current waveform this is instant 1 instant 2 is marked here instant 3 is marked over here deliberately we have taken the instance where one phase is carrying maximum current and at the same instant of time other two phases are carrying half of the maximum current if current in one phase is positive maximum then definitely the current in other two phases is going to be half of the maximum value and it must be flowing in the negative direction so starting with instant 1 i have drawn the mmfs produced by three phases for instant 1 it can be seen over here that mmf produced by phase a is directed along the magnetic axis of phase a in positive direction the mmf produced by phase b is directed along the magnetic axis of phase b but in reverse direction because the current of phase b is actually negative likewise the mmf produced by phase c is actually directed along the magnetic axis of phase c but in opposite direction again because the current in phase c is also negative so what we find at instant 1 the phasor sum of three mmfs the mmf fa the mmf fb and mmf fc the phasor sum of these three comes out to be 3 by 2 fm where fm is the peak value of mmf produced by any particular phase 
what we can conclude from this particular instant phasor diagram itself that the resultant MMF is having a constant amplitude of 3 by 2 or 1.5 fm and it is directed along the magnetic axis of phase A. Phase A is was carrying the maximum current at instant 1. Likewise, let us consider the instant 2 and instant 3. At instant 2, what we can see is current IA equals to IB equals to IM by 2, it is positive, we can see over here. At the same time, the current in phase C is, phase C is negative and it is at the peak value. The distribution of 3 MMFs along the magnetic axis of the respective phases is shown in this particular figure. What we can see is, as the phase A and phase B currents are positive, the two MMFs FA and FB representing the magnitude of FM by 2 are along their respective magnetic axis, that is along the magnetic axis of phase A and phase B respectively, right. The phase C carries maximum current and it is in negative direction. So, the phasor of MMF FC would be of double the length as compared to the phasor of MMF FB and FA and it is directed along the magnetic axis of phase C but in the opposite direction. Why so? Because current in phase C is negative here. So, what we find over here is resultant magnitude, resultant of uh, resultant MMF magnitude is again 3 by 2 fm, it comes out to be 3 by 2 or 1.5 fm and now it is directed along the magnetic axis of phase C. Why so? Because the phase C was the phase which was carrying maximum current at instant 2. Likewise, now let us consider the instant 3. For instance, what happens at the instant 3? See, this is the instant 3. At instant 3, phase, phase B current is maximum and positive. Phase A and C currents are negative and having an amplitude of having an amplitude of I m by 2. Accordingly, we can draw the phasor sum. Accordingly, we can draw, we can determine the resultant MMF for instant 3 as well. So, when the resultant MMF at instant 3 is determined, we will find it is an exercise for you. It is found that the resultant MMF comes out to be 3 thrice FM by 2 or simply 1.5 FM and under these conditions of instant 3, the resultant MMF would be directed along the magnetic axis of phase B, right. This can further be extended for further explore more instants of time over this waveform. Let me mark instant 4 here. Let me mark instant 5 here. Let me mark instant 6 over here. So, the same analysis can be extended for all these instants of time. We will find what we can conclude is that resultant MMF is having a constant amplitude of 1.5 FM and is always directed along the magnetic axis of the phase which is carrying maximum current at that particular instant of time. So, if the phase sequence of the supply is ABC, then we will find that my rotating magnetic field is actually rotating from magnetic axis of phase A to phase B to phase C. If suppose we want to reverse the direction of rotation of the rotating magnetic field, what I have to do is simply reversal of the phase sequence. So, if I make the phase sequence to be ACB, I will find that rotating magnetic field is now rotating in opposite direction. The principle of operation of three phase induction motor, why does the rotor of motor rotate, right? So, when a three phase winding when a three phase supply is given to the three phase winding of three phase induction motor. What is the three phase winding? The winding which phases of uh, which phases the winding having phases displaced from one another by an angle of 120 degree. So, when a three phase supply is given to the three phase winding of the stator of a three phase induction motor, a rotating magnetic field is created. Now, what happens? We know the construction of the motor as well. What happens? This rotating magnetic field is having a constant resultant amplitude and it is rotating. For example, at any particular instant of time, 
if suppose this is the location of poles M and S and suppose the rotating magnetic field is rotating in clockwise direction then at certain other instant of time we will find the location of poles to be here at some other instant of time it would be here then it would be here and so on. So, what we find that that field is rotating at a particular speed. The speed of rotation of the field is given by ns equals to 120 f upon p. ns is said to be the synchronous speed. It is given by 120 f upon p and it is in rpm. The same speed can also be written in rps as twice f upon p. It is in rps or revolutions per second. So, this rotating magnetic field when rotates, when links with the rotor conductors, the rotor is yet stationary. So, when this rotating magnetic field links with the rotor conductors, the relative speed exists between the rotating magnetic field and the stationary rotor conductors. So, what happens because of this? Because of this, as per Faraday's laws of electromagnetic induction, an EMF is induced in the rotor circuit. We know that rotor circuit is a complete circuit. So, when an EMF is induced in the rotor circuit, a current will start flowing in the rotor conductors. When a current is flowing in the rotor conductors, it will give rise to its own rotating magnetic field. It will give rise to its own magnetic field, right? What happens next? As per Lenz's law, whenever the Faraday's laws of electromagnetic, uh, whenever we have got an induced EMF due to Faraday's laws of electromagnetic induction, Lenz's law always X. As per Lenz's law, what we say? The effect opposes the cause of its induction. So, induced currents or the induced EMF, I must say, opposes the cause of its induction. What is the cause of induction of the induced currents in the rotor conductors? The cause of induction of induced currents in rotor conductors is the relative speed between rotating magnetic field and the rotor conductors. So, in order to oppose the cause of induction of the induced currents, rotor actually starts rotating in the direction of rotating magnetic field so as to reduce the relative speed between the rotating magnetic field and the rotor conductors. In this manner, rotor starts rotating. The same thing can also be explained with the application of Fleming's right hand and left hand rule. Let us consider this particular case. Let us consider the figure A. What it is showing? It is showing that field is created in such a direction, in such a direction that N must be here, S must be here. This is the field. It is showing this is the air gap. This area is the air gap of the machine. This is showing the inner periphery of the stator. This is showing the outer periphery of the rotor and some conductors are shown over the outer periphery of the rotor. Right? Field is rotating in clockwise direction. Now, we know the direction of direction of uh, rotating magnetic field. We know the rotational direction of rotating magnetic field as well. For determination of induced EMF in a particular rotor conductor, I can apply the Fleming's right hand rule. Now, as per Fleming's right hand rule, if first finger is indicating the direction of the field, thumb is indicating the direction of rotation of the conductor, then the middle finger is going to indicate the direction of induced EMF or induced current in the rotor conductor. But what happens here? My field is rotating, not the rotor. So, with respect to the rotation of the field, what I have to consider? I have to consider that field is stationary, but rotor is rotating. So, if the field, if the direction of rotation of field was clockwise, if we consider this field to be stationary, then I will find that my rotor is actually rotating in anti-clockwise direction. So, with respect to this, let me apply the Fleming's right hand rule. Thumb is pointing in the direction, thumb is pointing in the direction of rotation of the rotor, which is in anti-clockwise direction. The first finger is pointing the direction of direction of magnetic field, then the middle finger will point out the direction of it will point out the direction of induced EMF in rotor conductor, which comes out to be a dot. Now, what we know? We know that a dot, dot direction of current is induced, is induced here in rotor conductors. The field direction is downward. Let me consider a particular instant of time and let me apply the Fleming's left hand rule now for determination of 
torque direction of torque produced over rotor conductor so as per this this is the direction of the first finger is representing the direction of magnetic field middle finger is representing the direction of current in rotor conductor which is which is a dot in this particular case if these two conditions are like this then thumb will point the direction of rotation of the rotor what it implies it implies that rotor direction comes out to be clockwise what was the original direction of rotating magnetic field it was in the clockwise direction so what we can conclude from here that under these conditions the rotor will start rotating in the direction of rotating magnetic field itself now for development of the phasor diagram of three phase induction motor let us consider certain similarities and the differences between a transformer and the induction motor an induction motor is actually similar to a transformer but with rotating short circuited secondary transformer is a static device whereas induction motor is a rotating device its rotor is short circuited in nature that rotor actually forms the secondary of the transformer short circuited secondary of the transformer the stator winding of induction motor corresponds to the primary winding of the transformer rotor winding of induction motor corresponds to the secondary winding just like in case of a transformer both these machines works on the principle of electromagnetic induction we know that very well the equivalent circuit equivalent circuit and the phasor diagram of both machines is similar and this is something which are which we are going to prove after this right in a transformer what happens the electrical load connect is connected across the secondary terminals what happens initially when primary supply is given to the primary winding of the transformer a magnetic field is created this magnetic field being being pulsating in nature links with the rotor conductors as well as with the stator conductors this field actually produces this current produces a flux this flux induces an emf in the secondary winding as well as in primary winding now when secondary is open circuited there is no current flowing in the secondary but when some load is connected in the secondary circuit a secondary current starts flowing in the circuit what happens because of this secondary current is actually the induced current in transformer and as per lenz's law this secondary current opposes the cause of its induction the cause of the induction was the flux present in the magnetic circuit of the machine so so the current this flux the flux produced by secondary current actually tries to neutralize tries to demagnetize the magnetic circuit of transformer but if the induced if the applied voltage is constant the flux has to remain almost constant so what happens to counterbalance the demagnetizing effect of secondary induced currents primary starts drawing one more component of current which is referred as the load component of current so this load component of current is also present in case of a three phase induction motor this is a similarity these are certain similarities and this one being the biggest now let us consider certain differences between the induction motor and the transformer we know that in case of induction motor the flux path is completed by the uh, air gap in case of transformer this flux path is actually completed by the iron core so definitely the reluctance of iron core is quite less as compared to the reluctance of the as compared to the reluctance of the air gap right so what happens because of this the no load component of current of induction motor the no load component of current of induction motor or i can say the exciting current of the induction motor which is nothing but the summation of two components of current those two components of currents are the magnetizing current and the core loss component of current current i e exciting current of induction motor is summation of phasor sum of core loss component of current and the magnetizing component of current the magnetizing component of current is quite high as compared to the magnetizing component of current in case of a transformer and the reason being the presence of air gap in the magnetic circuit of induction motor so an induction motor draws a high no load current which is approximately 30 to 50% or 30 to 40% of the rated current whereas in case of transformer this exciting current or no load current is merely 1 to 5% of the rated current transformer is a static device and induction motor is a is a rotating machine in case of transformer both windings are the 
in case of a transformer the both windings are distributed around the periphery of air gap in case of transformer let me correct here in case of induction motor both windings are distributed around the air gap periphery whereas in case of transformer the windings are concentrated this is another big difference between the two the leakage reactance of induction motor is quite high as compared to that of a transformer now with these similarities let us now move to the development of phasor diagram of three phase induction motor starting with the reference phasor phi so i have taken phi as the reference phasor over here phi is produced what is phi phi is the flux per pole in a three phase induction motor just like a transformer phi is present here phi is linking with the rotor conductors as well as stator conductors phi is actually created by magnetizing component of current so the magnetizing component of current is drawn in line with the flux phi another component is the quadrature component with respect to current im this component of current is current ic which is referred as the core loss component of the current the core loss component of the current is shown over here it is at an angle of 90 degree with respect to the magnetizing component of current the phasor sum of these two currents is actually the exciting current or no load current but it is we are considering this phasor diagram at stand still condition of the machine when we are considering the phasor diagram at stand still condition there is no rotation of the rotor there are no mechanical losses taking place in the machine under these conditions i must refer this current to be simply the exciting current ie there is some difference between exciting current and the no load current of induction motor we will discuss that difference later on so here we we reach to this particular phasor this particular phasor is the phasor of the exciting current we will we will refer this current as ie now the flux phi causes induction of emf e1 in the stator winding and induction of emf e2 in the rotor winding the rotor circuit being a closed circuit we can complete a current starts flowing in the rotor circuit let this current be i2 the phase difference between the e2 and i2 is the rotor circuit power factor angle denoted by theta2 right let us complete the rotor voltage phasor diagram for this i must know the kvl in the for the rotor circuit in rotor circuit the induced emf is e2 this induced emf e2 have to overcome the rotor voltage drops what are the rotor voltage drops rotor winding have got its own resistance and the reactance we are considering the stand still condition of the rotor the reactance x2 can be written as twice pi f l twice pi fl2 where l2 is the leakage inductance of rotor winding f is the frequency of induced emf in rotor winding the frequency of induced emf in rotor winding under the stand still condition is same as the supply frequency so it is simply f so the voltage drop i2 r2 in phase with the current i2 the voltage drop i2 x2 would be at an angle of 90 degree lead with respect to the current i2 phasor i have drawn the summation of these two phasors to be equal to the phasor of e2 where e2 is the induced emf in rotor circuit under the stand still condition right now let us come to the other side to counterbalance the demagnetizing effect of current i2 rotor current i2 the stator starts drawing one component of current i2 dash such that i2 dash n2 dash where n2 dash is the effective number of turns let me just correct the let me just correct the symbol it is i2 dash n1 i2 dash n1 dash must be equal to i2 n2 dash n1 dash and n2 dash are the effective number of turns in stator and rotor of the machine right i2 dash is the rotor i2 dash is the component of rotor current referred to the stator side 
the component of rotor current referred to stator side i2 dash would be such that it it will satisfy this equation so as per this equation i can write down the magnitude of current i2 dash as equal to i2 into n2 dash upon n1 dash right so i have drawn i2 dash just opposite to the phasor of current i2 now in my stator there are two current components one current component is ie second current component is i2 dash the phasor sum of ie and i2 dash is giving me the current i1 i1 is the stator current right we have reached to the phasor of stator current now let us complete the voltage phasor diagram of three phase induction motor on the stator side for this i need to refer this voltage towards this side voltage e1 was the induced emf in the stator winding it is the back emf of the motor actually rotating this e1 by an angle of 180 degree gives me the phasor of minus e1 what is the meaning of minus sign over here you will find later on when we will draw the equivalent circuit that induced the mf e1 always acts in opposition to the stator applied voltage right stator applied voltage so just to get rid of this minus sign let us replace minus e1 by some fictitious voltage v1 dash v1 dash is nothing but the induced voltage in stator winding right now adding the i1 r1 voltage drop and i1 x1 voltage drop to the phasor of v1 dash gives me the stator applied voltage v1 let us see the phase angle between v1 and the current i1 v1 is the applied voltage to the stator winding i1 is the current drawn by the stator winding from the supply so theta1 is nothing but the motor's own power factor angle this phasor diagram is drawn under the condition of standstill and we know that under standstill condition slip as is always equal to 1 right so that slip is not appearing in the equation of induced emf in rotor circuit next let us draw the equivalent sorry let us draw the phasor diagram of the machine under running condition so this we are considering under the running condition of the machine what is the difference a major difference which i must tell you is between the current ie and current i not when motor was at standstill ie had to overcome had two components the two components were the magnetizing component of current and the core loss component of current the magnetizing component of current is responsible for production of flux or for magnetization of the magnetic circuit of the machine the core loss component of current is responsible to take into account the core losses taking place in the machine what happens now now rotor is rotating when rotor is rotating another component of constant losses comes into the picture that component is the mechanical losses so when we are considering the phasor diagram under running condition i will replace the exciting current by no load current i will refer this current to be the no load current of induction motor and the purpose of no load current of induction motor is to take into account the magnetization of the wind magnetic circuit and the uh, uh, take it has to take into account the core losses as well as mechanical losses taking place in the machine right so as just what have we have done on previous slide to draw the phasor diagram under standstill condition phi is taken as the reference phasor se2 is the induced emf now in the rotor circuit of the machine because now the rotor is rotating and under the condition when rotor is rotating slip frequency emf is induced in it as e2 must be equal to the voltage drop total voltage drop in the rotor circuit i2 z2 we'll see here current i2 is the current flowing in the rotor circuit because of presence of load the power factor of this 
the power factor of this current is now improved. There is a reduction in the power factor angle as compared to this case. What is the reason? Reason being rotor is now rotating. The voltage drop I2 R2 is in phase with current I2. The voltage drop S I2 X2 or I must say I2 S X2 is at an angle of 90 degree. This voltage is actually leading the current phasor by an angle of 90 degree. The summation of these two gives us the rotor induced EMF as the rotor circuit is closed. So, the induced EMF must be equal to the voltage drops taking place in the circuit. Now, as we have done in previous case, I need to refer this component of current which is the load current to the stator side. So, I2 dash is the rotor referred component of current on stator side. You can see the phasor sum of current I0 and I2 dash will give us the phasor of current I1. Agreed. Now, let us refer the induced EMF E1 towards this side. So, giving a rotation of 180 degree by providing a rotation of 180 degree, we need to apply this negative sign over here. Let us simply replace minus E1 by some voltage V1 dash. So, V1 dash is the induced EMF in stator winding under these conditions. We need to add the stator resistance drop. We need to add the stator reactance drop to get the stator applied voltage V1's phasor, right? So, voltage V1 and current I1. V1 is the applied voltage to the stator. I1 is the current drawn by the stator from the supply. The angle between the, these two is phi 1. Phi 1 is said to be the power factor angle of the motor and we can very well see that under load condition there is an improvement in the operating power factor of induction motor. You can compare the two phasor diagrams. Theta 1 was theta 1 or phi 1 whichever you are taking for the power factor. So, theta 1 here is quite large and you will see that the theta 1 angle got reduced to a low value under running condition, right. From this phasor diagram, I can very well write down the equation of voltage on stator side. So, phasor V1 is equal to V1 dash plus J I1 R1 plus J I1 X1. This is the voltage equation as per this particular phasor diagram. <coughs> With respect to this voltage phasor diagram, uh, this voltage equation, which is obtained from the phasor diagram of the motor, we will now draw the equivalent circuit of stator side of three phase induction motor. So, further proceeding to the three phase, to the equivalent circuit of three phase induction motor, equivalent circuit right now, the equivalent circuit of stator side is only drawn. Let me redraw the equation. The voltage V1 can be written as V1 dash plus I1 R1 plus J I1 X1. So, voltage V1 have to take into account the counter EMF induced in stator winding, the I1 R1 voltage drop, the I1 X1 voltage drop. Let me write one more equation. I know that current I1 actually consists of what? Current I1 consists of two components IC and IM. So, it is IC plus JIM or simply I can write that phasor of current I1, it is plus I2 dash. I can write down that phasor of current I1 can be written as I naught as the phasor summation of I naught and I 2 dash. Here, I can write I naught as the phasor sum of current I C and I M, right. In the equivalent circuit, the current I naught is shown to be flowing in two components. One component is R C and it is carrying the current I C. Another component is I m. Another component in equivalent circuit is J x m and it is carrying the current I m. I m being the magnetizing component of current such that, such that I m is in magnitude is equal to V 1 dash upon x m and I c in magnitude is equal to V 1 dash upon R c, right. Besides this, the voltage across this parallel branch is voltage V1 dash. 
Besides this, I1 R1 voltage drop is the voltage drop in stator winding resistance. J I1 X1 voltage drop is the voltage drop in the reactance of the stator winding, leakage reactance of the stator winding. The voltage across terminals A and B is equal to voltage V1 dash. Now, to complete the equivalent circuit of the motor, I need to combine the rotor equivalent circuit across the terminals A and B. For this, let us first develop the equivalent circuit of the rotor. What we know? The purpose induced EMF in rotor circuit is given by SC2. Rotor circuit is a closed circuit. The current I2 flowing in the rotor circuit formed by the rotor circuit power phase resistance R2 and the leakage reactance Sx2 under running condition of the motor. What is the problem with the equivalent circuit of rotor shown by figure 1? Here, the current flowing, the induced voltage and the current flowing in the rotor circuit is actually at the slip frequency. When we need to combine the rotor equivalent circuit with the stator equivalent circuit, both these circuits must must operate at the same frequency. So, for this what I have to do? I simply have to rewrite this equation in this form, right? Here what we can see? We can see that x2 is, x2 is free from the frequency component, e2 is free from the frequency component and this frequency component in the terms of slip s is appearing with this. So, with respect to this second equation, the equivalent circuit of rotor can be drawn in this manner. Now, let us combine the two equivalent circuits, but before combining the two equivalent circuits, I will combine, I will join these two terminals to the terminals which were shown over here, right. Before joining these two terminals, I have to ensure that the voltage of two terminals is same. So, what I have to do for that? I need to refer this voltage towards the stator side as there is a difference between the number of turns of the stator and the rotor, right. I need to refer this component, I need to refer this component to the stator side, I need to refer this current to the stator side. We have already defined current I2 in the stator circuit. This current I2 in the stator circuit is given by current I2 dash. We have already written the equation of current I2 dash. Now, the two circuits can be joined like this. Now, what is the voltage over here? Voltage V1 dash. We have referred the voltage V E2 such that E2 we know that E2 is proportional to N2 dash. We know that V1 dash is proportional to N1 dash. So, at the terminals AB of the stator, the voltage must be V1 dash. So, V1 dash can well be written as N1 dash upon N2 dash multiplied by E2, right? We need to refer the parameters of rotor circuit towards stator side. So, they can be written as R2 dash upon S plus x2 dash and they are nothing but n1 dash upon n2 dash square multiplied by r2 upon s plus j x2 r2 dash upon s plus j x2 dash it was right. So, after referring these values to the stator circuit, I can combine, I can make the equivalent circuit like this. So, this is the complete equivalent circuit of induction motor. Just for simplicity, I have redrawn the equivalent circuit where I have dropped the prime notation with x2, r2 and i2, but x2, r2 and i2 are the stator side referred components of the rotor parameters and the current. So, this is the complete equivalent circuit of the induction motor which can be rewritten in this particular, this can be redrawn in this particular manner for a particular purpose. Rest of the topics will include the torque production, the power flow with respect to the equivalent circuit, the torque production and the torque speed characteristic. I will continue those topics in the le next lecture of the subject. In this particular equivalent circuit, what I have done? I have just, let us compare this equivalent circuit with the previous one. I have, I have actually break this resistance R2 upon S into two components. Those two components are R2 plus 
R2 into 1 minus S upon S, right? So, we get this particular form of the equivalent circuit. What is resistance R2 here? Resistance R2 over here is the per phase value of the rotor resistance. What is resistance R2 into 1 minus S upon S? R2 into 1 minus S upon S is actually the electrical analogy of mechanical load at the shaft of the motor. To see the flow of power, let me cover till this topic. To see the flow of power, to see the flow of power, what I have done over here is the stator input power is shown here. I have taken certain partitions and these partitions are representing the power flow. So, stator input power is taken over here. The stator I square R loss is the I1 square R1 loss across this resistance. Stator core loss is actually the core losses and core losses are taken into account by this resistive branch. Then comes at this point I will see it is the power input to rotor. Then rotor I2 square R2 loss in this section. Then the power developed across this resistance is actually the internal mechanical power developed in the rotor denoted by Pm and after this comes if we want to determine the shaft power or useful power output what I have to do I have to subtract the mechanical losses from the internal mechanical power developed by the rotor. So that is all for this lecture. I will continue with rest of the topics in next lecture of the subject.